Welcome everyone to a new episode of Genuine Rockstars and today's Genuine Rockstar is Melina Jobbins. Thank you so much for joining us, Melina. Thank you for having me. Could you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? I come from France originally uh, and I'm now doing my PhD at the University of Zurich, working specific, like, so specifically on capitals from the Lady of Union of Morocco. You're a paleontologist with a specialization in early vertebrates. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into vertebrate paleontology and how you ended up studying uh, placoderms? My interest started actually at a very long, young age, like most people, I guess, in the field. Uh, like already when I was a little, like a tiny little girl, I was just running around in the garden looking for beautiful rocks and more without knowing at the time. Like I found my first fossil, I was like eight. Or so like it was a, I still have it little bivalve and uh from then on I got my very first uh, dig your own dinosaur kit it's all like tiny kids kit and from then I just like fell in love with like field work fossil hunting paleontology and that's how it led me to the university like later on to do my um bachelor's in geosciences because they had some courses in paleo so I just had to go there <laughs> Then I did my, uh, I moved on to do my master's in paleobiology. And then I moved on here to do my PhD with Christian Klug and Martin Rickling on placoderms mostly. But I did do my first paper on pilacocephalans, which are little crustaceans that are extinct now, but they're like the cutest little group. I really love them. And uh, yeah, now I'm doing vertebrates, <laughs> which is a nice transition, just slowly progressing. So, but you're not just doing any vertebrates, you're doing very early vertebrates. So like among the first animals with a backbone. Could you tell our audience what placoderms are? Sure. So placoderms are like, a, like as you said, a group of very early, like of early vertebrates, which is basically among the first vertebrates that appeared in the, in the fossil record. Um, they lived like during the Silurian to Devonian, which is like, for the public, approximately 430, 560 or so million years ago. So pretty old. <laughs> uh, and they have a, a few different features that like defines pathoderms. Uh One of them would be the dermal armor that they have. So they have a very strong dermal armor on the head and the what we call the thoracic part, so the whole shoulder part, which is all made of like plates, pretty much like assembled together. Uh, another feature would come after within the skeleton itself. Uh, the skeleton is made uh, not of the same bone as us. They're made of what we call perichondral bone. So it's mainly cartilage, but they're just surrounded. Like there's a very thin line of, uh, of bone around it. So this is very characteristic as well of pachyderms. And also they have these very cool teeth that don't have enamel and have some structures very similar to dentin that basically replaces the dentin that we have in our teeth. You recently published on new placoderms from Morocco, from the Devonian. Could you tell us uh, what you've studied and what you've discovered? So, like, this is a project that is going on, that's, it's been going on for a few years, and, like, we finally got to do it this past, like, year or two, like, mainly, mo mostly focusing on them. And so there are different groups in placoderms, and the main one, the most popular one that people know of the most is called arthrodires, which are considered to be more derived as well within the pachyderm group. Uh, some people might know the most famous ones like Cocosteus, which will be like roughly 20, 30 centimeters long, to the very large Dunkleosteus, where people sometimes see the skull in museums that could reach, for some, like some people suggested, up to like 8 meters long. I always think Ducleosteus is the most popular one because it's ugly. It's very, it's, it has this very like monster-like vibe from it, but at the same time, very cool. It's like, imagine having this in the ocean. <laughs> Back at the time, it must have been quite impressive. So we focus mostly on Aphrodias. These are the ones we tend to find the most in Morocco. And the ones we found are very special because the, so they come in nodules. Most of the specimens came in nodules. And they come with, within the nodule itself, you can actually see we have two specimens with the, a preserved body outline. So you can actually see the dorsal fin as well as the caudal fin, so the tail, and also the pectoral fins. 
we don't have the pelvic fins, but we do have what we call the pelvic girdle. So the, the bone that is like basically is the pelvic, lead to the pelvic fin. So that's pretty cool. Usually you don't find this. It's very rare when you find these kinds of like. Yeah, and if if most of the bone consists of cartilage, the preservation, of course, needs to be very good, and likely it doesn't preserve. So, but then if you have a body outline, you can still tell the story. We do have some also like the so these specimens are quite like it's pretty cool because you have the body outline, but you also have the the counterpart of like some of the like skeletal parts. So you have a few remains of like the vertebral column, some remains of like the the skull as well, and the what we call again the thoracic armor, the shoulder parts. In these specimens you found the sensory line canals on the skull? Yes, we have like there's multiple sensory lines. So we are also animals with a backbone and we don't have sensory lines. I wouldn't say so no. Could you tell us how these sensory lines work? Can they feel like vibrations in the water or? Yeah, typically it's used for detecting like vibrations in the water, movement, these kinds of things. So then they could, for example, it could help them with escaping prey or on the opposite predation if they need to like catch prey. Uh, they can feel like change of currents, it's like these kinds of things. So it basically works like a sensory organ. So you named a new genus and species. Yeah. That is super cool. Um, to be fair, I think the name is amazing. Uh, could you tell us uh, a little bit about the name? Amatictis is named after the Berber group, ethnic group in Morocco, where the specimens come from. And the group is called Amatig. So we thought that it would be nice to name something like the species from the community there. So we decided to name it Amatictis. And we also call the species uh, Trinastica after Kate Trinastic because she did contribute a lot of like papers, like big papers to the early vertebrates field in general. So we thought it would be nice to like name something after her as that doesn't seem to be done yet. Which advice would you have for our viewers who would also like to pursue a, a career, either a research or a practical career in vertebrate paleontology? <sighs> What? <laughs> what kind of advice? I mean, like, there's always these typical advices, like, like the typical things, like, like, don't be afraid to show your motivation, no matter your age. Like, always, like, go for it, even if you're not at the, like, some people would want to wait, for example, university level or so, and there's nothing wrong with, with that, like, neither. But if you, you know you really want to do this, don't hesitate if you're, like, in a lower grade, still in high school, even middle school. I would say the reverse is even true. If you're 40, 45 and you decide, hey, I want to do this. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So you start, go to museums, get some contacts a bit, get to maybe like do some small internships or so or volunteering positions, start, start gaining a bit of experience. And also it also kind of helps you to see if that's what you really want to do for the future. It gives you a little like, like an overview as well of like different things you can do, not just research, but also, oh, maybe I enjoy more public outreach maybe i enjoy doing exhibits or anything so it kind of gives you then a, an idea a bit more clear like what you'd like to do afterwards how do you like to spend the hours during which you're not studying placoderms or sleeping <laughs> well uh, i'm a nerd so uh i mean i do love spending that time outdoors it's very nice most of the time, if I'm outdoors and fossil, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm a submit on fossil hunting or doing field work. <laughs> Never gonna say no. Every chance I get, I do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. Right? And then otherwise, they can, like, just to keep your mind off of things or change, like, sometimes you need to get, like, out of your head or something. And then I would tend to go towards, like, doing Rubik's Cube, Legos, puzzles, all the cute little nerdy stuff that people, like to make fun of, but I don't really care. <laughs> no, that's not the type of audience we have. I think the type of audience we have is like, yes, yes, testing your brain, trying to solve puzzles. This is fun. Uh, I'm, I'm working on my timing. Like so far, I'm at like one mm, thirty to two minutes. What the hell, woman? <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Melina. You're a genuine rock star. Yeah.